Today we're diving into the eerie world of Lake Mungo, a 2008 Australian psychological horror film that masterfully blends mockumentary and supernatural elements to explore the depths of grief. We'll uncover the unique production challenges, the subtle scares, and the profound themes that make this film a hidden gem in the horror world. All of that here today and more on Patio Commentary. Hey everyone, how's it going? My name is Matt Jarbo. Welcome back to another episode of Patio Commentary. And I I wanted to cover a film that was very much in vain to Blair Witch, but was lower budget and was an acclaimed found footage or documentary style horror film. So last night I was uh, cruising through Tubi, as I, as I like to do, and I came across this movie and it struck me that I've heard of it. But I don't know anything about it. I've just heard that it's always on those lists of like the most unnerving documentary found footage horror films that it's it's in the upper echelon of those kind of movies. And I always love a good found footage. As you guys know, those are my favorite genre of films. But I like, all right, yeah, sure. Let's give it a watch. Let's give it a go. This movie came out in 2008. It is a very low budget horror movie. I don't even I don't even know if you want to call it a horror movie. It's definitely like a thriller, you know, and it it tries to do a lot. Uh, It definitely has its, its place within the echelons, the halls of, of, of thrillers and horrors and whatnot, but it it also kind of bites off a bit more than it can chew. We'll definitely dive into all of that because here today on the show, obviously we're going to go through some of the production history, give you guys information on all that, talk about my thoughts on the film. And then, you know, give a little bit of trivia at the end. And of course, where you can find it and everything else right now, like I said, it's on Tubi. So if you haven't seen the movie, go watch it, come back because this is going to be full of spoilers. And remember guys, if you like the show, if you enjoy what I do here on patio commentary, watching these movies, bigger, smaller in between, and you want me to watch a movie and give my thoughts on it that you want, you can always sponsor an episode, head on over to patreon.com forward slash Matt Jarbo. It's a great way to do that. Or just contact me directly. We can figure it out. Uh, Lots of people have already sponsored a bunch of episodes and they're always a lot of fun to do because they allow me to go and dive into movies that I probably normally wouldn't watch. And the audience enjoys me giving my take on movies that I probably normally wouldn't watch. A lot of you out there are anime fans, just saying, just saying on that one. However, this movie is one that definitely falls in its own place in my opinion. Like I'm having trouble kind of grappling on my own thoughts and feelings about it because there's elements of it that I really enjoyed, but there's elements of it that I didn't. And I just kind of want to start off by saying like the length of this movie is short. It's like an hour and 30 minutes with, with credits you're looking at maybe an hour 23 to an hour 25. It's a short watch, but it's a slow burn. (laughs) It is a very slow burn. So if you are easily distracted or if you cannot put yourself in a position to watch this without any distractions, like sit on your hands, don't fiddle with your phone, you might miss a couple things here and there. It really does take some time to kind of build up to where things are going and it throws some twists and turns at you that you may not be expecting. So it really is a good idea to sit down and to not be distracted. I unfortunately had the problem of uh kids and there's one particular scene in this movie that i did not know was going to be there that i was like caught off guard by and had to make sure that like and i was very glad at that time my my kids were nowhere around um if you i have two sick children right now they're both sleeping both happen to wake up as i was watching this movie so you know how it is but anyway i know i know useless information none of you seem to care about but that's perfectly fine so let's talk about lake mungo just overall what it is right it's a story of the Palmer family in the aftermath of the tragic drowning of their daughter, Alice. They are convinced that there might be supernatural elements. She may be still around in the house. And this documentary takes us through the process of them dealing with the grief, dealing with trying to get answers, uh, the, the, the pitfalls from those answers, not giving you the information that you want. And of course the, real wild twists and turns that kind of happen as this thing hits into the second half of this. But before we dive into all of that, you know, so the director on this, a guy by the name of Joel Anderson, 
who is a uh, surprisingly has not done anything else feature film wise since this. He wrote this script in 2005. He had a little bit of trouble trying to find the financing for it. He wanted it to be like a thriller that really explored grief. But he had the limited budget and couldn't really do everything he wanted to do with it. But he was able to go to the uh, like Australian Film Commission, whatever they're called, and get some money in order to put this movie together. They shot it for a very modest budget of $1.7 million. But that's like 1.7 million Australians. So I'm not too sure what the exchange rate is for USD, especially at the economy of 2007 when they shot it. But they did film this around various locations in Victoria, Australia, including the real locations of Sisters Rocks and Lank Mungo, which is a real place, by the way, which also apparently like uncovered like Cro-Magnum men, a man and a woman. Uh, there's like the Mungo man and Mungo lady. So there actually is some odd archaeological significance to the area where they found where they shot part of this movie. None of that has anything to do with the story. It's just like here is the the famous place where they shot part of this movie is at a place where this really significant human, you know, archaeological discovery <laughs> happened a couple of years prior. But when Joel went into filming this, obviously, like I said, with a very modest budget, he knew what he wanted to do. They shot the movie over about five weeks using both film and video formats. The also the choice for them to also only use low profile actors was a really great way of trying to add to the authenticity of this. Because in many instances, these movies, while mockumentary in nature, you know, they they're presented as real and people out there will believe them as real. And I don't know if I'd really call mockumentaries like a, I always feel like that's more of a parody. Right. Like a mockumentary is something that's making fun of. I don't know. Like you, it's not a, necessarily a documentary. It's like a docufiction. I, the, 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 the classification of this will probably vary person to person. I always view the term mockumentary as being more parody, satire, sarcastic in nature. This movie was very much presented straightforward. It's not played for laughs. There's nothing about this that's funny. It deals with some pretty serious themes. So I don't know what you'd want to call it. You guys, again, can kind of call it whatever you want to say. But I think docufiction is probably like the best classification at this point. But they wanted this to be authentic. So they only cast actors that would make you believe it's real. Like, for example, Blair Witch Project is a great, great example of this, right? Back in 1997, when they shot this movie, they only used college kids. When Artisan Entertainment picked up the rights to it and Artisan Entertainment went through the brilliant marketing plan and they used the website. Heather Donahue and the other people involved. These were people who kept a low profile. We didn't have social media at the time to track them down. We just had to take the media's word for it that they were dead. And that established the narrative in the eyes of the public that this was something that was real, that we were going to watch something really happening to these people. And that is what created that narrative. What really crafted that was the fact that these people did not go do press tours before the movie came out. It was only up until the days before the film came out that we learned that they were real uh, people, that they were alive. But until then, people really believed that this was something that was possible to have happened. I myself may have been a person like that for a little bit, but I was, I was only 17. All right. Cut me some slack. I was only 17 and I was really captivated by it. Okay. But here they wanted that and they, and they got that. The actors have been a little bit like critiqued for their performances because it was really improv, but I feel like that they were trying to convey like parents who were grief stricken and then also kind of like tasked with this idea of telling a compelling narrative to a documentarian who's interviewing them in a way that they, they're trying to grapple with professionalism as well as grief. It's, it's a mixed bag at times, but I do feel they, they did a really, really, really good job. And ultimately like even, what's funny too, is uh, Joel Anderson actually was the interviewer who was always off screen during the movie. And he actually chose to not be credited while they were filming this. And I thought that was a really unique way of approaching it. He didn't want to be like the, Oh, and featuring, you know, Joel Anderson as the interviewer would be kind of tacky, I think. But what he wanted is he did envision this movie as being more of an exploration of grief rather than a, a simple, like traditional supernatural thriller, which Again, I think he hits in some areas. I think he he misses in other areas, and we're going to talk about that 
uh, like I said, the movie had a $1.7 million budget. It did release in theaters. It only earned $29,850. That's not to say it hasn't done well on, or at least earned its money back in the subsequent 15, 16 years now of its release on home video. You can find it on Blu-ray. You can find it on DVD. I don't believe that there's a 4K. And of course, it's streaming in a bunch of different places. But we'll talk about that towards the end. This is one that I think found its home after the fact. And a lot of these movies do kind of find their audience after the fact. They find the people who are drawn to what they are. Like the vibe out of this movie that I got, I oddly enough, is kind of a Dear Zachary vibe. Not, not the same subject matter, but just the way that it's presented came across like a Dear Zachary vibe. And if you've ever seen Dear Zachary, you know what I'm talking about, right? It's not as hard hitting as that, but it's just the way, the vibe of it. I could see like, if, if this was real, it would be like another Dear Zachary. Kind of, maybe I'm overthinking. I don't quite know. So, but again, if, again, if you haven't seen Dear Zachary, that's not merely one that I want to talk about in regards to a future episode. It's a documentary about a real life case. It's a really tragic story. I watched it before I had kids. Now that I have kids, if I watch it again, it's going to probably hit me a lot harder. And uh, not something that I don't know if I if I want to be like emotionally vulnerable to share my feelings on. You know what I'm saying? But this movie is not that. It is not real. It stars Talia Zucker as Alice Palmer, David Pledger as Russell Palmer, Rosie Trainer as June Palmer, Martin Sharp uh, as Matthew Palmer. This is the family. Uh, these actors are not mainstream. These actors are are you know Talia Zucker has had a few roles after that. Like I said, even Joel Anderson didn't go on to do anything. The last credit he has on IMDb is that he was a script editor on Late Night with the Devil. That just came out. And other than that, he had like one or two other credits. Like, I don't get it. If you got this movie done, you got this movie out there. Why not go do more? That's what I don't understand about this is because it's like the movie is interesting and compelling enough. There's a series on Tubi and in, in, in Amazon and a bunch of other places called The Blackwell Ghost. It's like one guy with these stories. They're on number eight right now. So clearly he's made enough to continue making more. I don't know why. I would love to see Joel Anderson come back and, and tackle another supernatural thriller story uh, with the technology we have today and everything else. And I, I just, I feel bad when people have like that kind of talent for storytelling, at least slow burn storytelling, and they just don't move forward. So anyway, let's, let's dive into the film itself. So the movie, you know, presented as real in 2000. And five, Alice Palmer, 16 years old, drowns at a lake when she's out with her family. They find the body, uh, had fallen to the bottom of the lake. They pull it out of the water. The dad identifies it. The mom doesn't. After that, they start kind of feeling like there's something in the house. There's some kind of entity that's there. The brother, Matthew, having trouble coping and grieving, also starts setting up cameras around the house. After taking a picture of the backyard and seeing what appears to be the ghost of Alice. Other people out in the woods around the lake have also seen what they think is the ghost of Alice. Something that is uh, a humanoid in form, a, a shadowy figure in the distance, looking like a young girl wearing a certain hoodie, right? The certain hoodie that she would wear. And from there, they end up putting cameras in the home and they capture images of a shadow moving or what appears to be Alice in a mirror or something along those lines. And they're convinced that she's trying to tell them something. They're convinced that she's not dead. And the dad even goes, I, I don't even know what's going on here. Like my wife is so convinced that our daughter is still alive, that I am not too sure if I believe what I saw when I looked at her body and confirmed her identity. So they go to the, to the local police and they get the police to exhume the corpse they do a DNA test. It comes back confirmed. This is Alice Palmer's body. And then you find out after they go and they get a psych, uh, like a psychic, a radio psychic named Ray to come do seances, so on and so forth. And nothing happens. Well, the video comes out from another family who had seen uh, been at the lake the day the one guy had the video footage of what appeared to be Alice in the background. And it showcases that it's actually Matthew walking through the woods wearing 
Alice's hoodie. And then you find out that Matthew faked the photographs and he faked all of the sightings. And that's a pretty big whammy. You know what I mean? Because you're like, okay, this is like halfway through the movie at this point. And you're like, what the hell? What did you, what, wait, what you guys just took out? You, okay, so now what is this? What's going on here? Like, where, where is this story going to go when you all of a sudden now have your main subject line? It just kneecapped. The whole thing was fake. Okay, so she's dead. The family's grieving. The son obviously is, is grieving. So he's, he's manufacturing all of these spirit, you know, spirit visions, ghost pictures, all this stuff in order to what? Help the mom grieve, help the dad kind of go cr a little crazier because like they now think that the, that their daughter maybe isn't dead, that they think that, that the, that there's a ghost and whatever. And then you're thinking like, well, where's this movie going to go? And then they just go, no, by the way, it really was ghosts, right? If you look in the background of the image, you're still going to see, you know, effigies of Alice. It's really there. Just it's, you have to go back and look at it again. So he's faking the ghosts and now that there's real ghosts, but then but then we get thrown another loop in one of the images. And I was watching this like early on in the movie too. When, when we see like the, the, the image of the hallway and the shadow walk past, I'm looking at the other side of the image and I see what appears to be somebody there, the shape of a person's head. Don't know who it is uh, and whatever. And then we find out that it's the neighbor. It's the neighbor. And he was in Alice's room looking for something. And then they find Alice is safe because Alice kept secrets. Uh, she was good at keeping secrets. You know what I mean? Like, and her friend, that's like a line you hear a couple times in the movie as repeated by the friend. And, and then they open the safe and inside the safe, you know, they magically have the keys. I don't know how they find the keys, but whatever. There's a couple moments in this movie where like suspension of disbelief for what a 16 year old girl would do. I don't know. But then they find this tape. So this is where it gets weird. This is where, like, if you're watching this around this time, if you're watching this, like, if you listen, whatever, like, make sure no one's around. Because on the tape, you're like, what's on the tape? It's not going to be something good. Well, it's it's her, and she's in a three-way with the neighbors. Now, you got to remember, she's, like, 16 in the movie. She's, like, 15, 16 in the movie. And you see, like, the dude's butt, right? So, like, here's the thing. I'm watching this movie. I got the, the kids are, are just waiting. I don't know this is coming. My girlfriend comes in the room as that scene is on, right? And I'm waiting for that scene to end because I don't, if I start fumbling with the remote, she's going to know something's up. And then she sees the TV and she sees it and she looks at me. What are you watching? There are, you know, and I'm like, I don't, I didn't know what's on the movie. I, I, I skipped past it 30 seconds. It, I, I didn't even know. Like, it's one of those things where you're watching. It's like, you don't know what's going on. You're like, you don't know what's going to happen. It hits you with it. It's weird. You're trying to process. Wait a minute. Why is this in the movie? Then in comes your partner. Who was like, wait, why are you watching porn in the middle of the day? Because it was shot like a porno. And it's just, it's yeah, right. Comedy of errors. Like I'm saying, if you're watching this movie, make sure no one else is around for the midway part. Cause you're going to look like a weirdo. So I just skipped right past it. I'm like, I don't need to see that. Right. Cause that, I mean like legitimately like that to me is like, mm, I get what Joel Anderson's trying to do with that. But I feel like showing a little bit of it was like still a little bit too far. It's shocking. And maybe that's what they needed. That's what he was going for was the shocking angle of it. The idea that like, yeah, she was in this consensual relationship with these, with these people that she babysat for. Um, You know, obviously fans of Brazzers are going to be like, well, I want to see the scene, but there's, I was a bit weird, but then they go into a little bit about like, about the family. Like where did the family go? Cause like six months after she died, they got up, sold the house, moved away. No one's been able to find him. Even though it's said that the, the dad says that they talked to the cops and the cops said he would probably get like a commuted sentence or nothing at all because it would have been consensual. So because the videotape showcases that it was consensual, they never mentioned it again. That's a big one. In my opinion, that's a big one. You find out that your daughter who drowned, who I think, it's starting to look more and more and more like she probably killed herself. Had, had a threesome while underage with the neighbors that she babysat for from when their kids were young. She didn't tell her boyfriend. Uh, her boyfriend didn't know about it. But I think her boyfriend gets a little bit of revenge on her. Because like not long afterward, 
the mom's like looking through the diary and comes across like the Lake Mungo trip that she took earlier in 2005 before she died. And that's when it cuts back to the boyfriend and the boyfriend's like, yeah, there was video footage because when, when she came back from the trip, she didn't have her cell phone or her bracelets, like her, her, her prized possessions. She didn't have when she came back from this trip and the parents were upset, but they were like, okay, you know, they weren't going to press her on it, whatever. But then they find out that there was more video footage taken of that night and that the ex-boyfriend gave it to the family. And when asked about it, he was like, well, we don't want it to be seen like we're hiding anything, but then also why not? But the way like he's like the actor, because again, he's not like a professional actor. He almost has this like smile behind his face while he's doing it. And I don't know if that's intentional with the actor or just like he was just nervous and they were getting through his scenes in like an hour outside this rock where they were interviewing him, uh, which I think is his sister's rocks I mentioned earlier. And, and I think like that might've been it. Like he was just like, it seemed almost like there was malicious intent. Like she hurt him and, and he wanted to maybe in some way hurt her family or hurt her. I might be overthinking that, but it felt like there might've been some kind of like just anger that was there. And I, I assume it probably would be because the friends had no idea about the tape and they had no idea about the threesome. They had no idea about the affair. And, and they were like, they were concerned. Cause like she was really good at keeping secrets. None of us knew her. Like the friend Kim says, I think I knew one Alice and I think her parents knew another Alice and there's probably a third Alice. None of us knew. I'm paraphrasing, but that's basically like, that's, I mean, that's also like most people, you know, they've got their out front personality, their friend personality, their family personality, and then their true personality, what they keep to themselves. And that's a big factor for this movie, I think is like trying to learn like more about Alice and what she was into. But the problem though, is that it kind of just like, again, slow burn to get there. So when they go out to Lake Mungo, they kind of almost instantly find where she buried some, some, some stuff. Cause on the tape, sorry, I got ahead of myself there. On the tape, they find that Alice had been burying something. So they go out there and they find it almost instantaneously. It had been six or seven months since her death. Uh, the mom just finds it right away. She pulls out the bag. You can see that there's no dirt on the bag. There's no dirt inside the bag. Everything is pristine. Like they just set it on the ground. I get it. It's a low budget movie, but at least you bury it. And then you, and then you unbury it, you know, <laughs> like you got to make it look at least somewhat real. That's kind of, uh, that's at least how I see it. But they find her Nokia and she had recorded stuff on her own Nokia. And you find out that like, she had this vision. She's walking with the phone and she comes across like a ghost that looks just like her, but it's like a bloated carcass that they pulled out of the water. It didn't really look like that. I mean, they, they kind of very quickly juxtaposed it with the image of her that like the coroner's photo of her. Uh, to showcase like, this is really her, you know? And I get why they did that as a way to kind of like trick your brain into thinking that this is the case. And then that's kind of about it. Like they realized she went to the same psychic that the parents went to, that the mom went to and was asking him to interpret dreams. And, you know, so they got mad at the psychic, but they ultimately kind of like, you know, repaired things and whatever, because he didn't tell them that he was working with her, but he's also like, well, client confidentiality. I mean, so it's a good argument. But then after they discover the tape, after they discover this information, after they start piecing it together that she thought she was going to die, she almost knew she was going to die, when she was going to die, how she was going to die, that once they discovered all that, that she showed them spiritually, whatever, that she, this is why she did what she did or, or just who she was. Then after that, the mom's like, then the house, we came home and the house felt different. Like we got that closure going back to the line. The dad said earlier on about the mom, not confirming the body. She never saw her. So she never got the closure. And then they decided to move and, and just kind of move on with their life and try to leave that pain behind while still holding on to her memory. But then at the very end, you discover that no, Alice, there's really images of Alice everywhere. She was, she was really a ghost the whole time. I mean, like, okay. I get it, right? For what it was, it's effective. For what it was, it works. It is compelling. It's interesting. 
But when you throw like twists at us, like there is the faking of the the images, and then almost immediately a few minutes later, you find out about the threesome with an underage person. It's like, and then like, and then like after, then they move on to the other. It's like, okay, hold on. Like I get that they only had 1.7 million and they shot this over five weeks and they were really wanting to more so explore grief versus anything else. And I think they very much accomplished that. In my opinion, they, I think they really did accomplish that. So I don't, I don't think there's anything in the movie that they could have probably done different to, to get to a different outcome. But again, the idea here, the concept of the, the, the twists that they throw and then the lack of, you know, closure, like we don't know where this guy is. Well, why not add a little bit at the end there? Like, like he was found living in another country. He was ultimately served, uh, you know, uh, charged with, with statutory or whatever it was. And, uh, he, you know, he pled out and then it's like, okay, fine. There's closure on that storyline. You know, what happened with, with the brother? Like, did the brother get into photography and stop, you know, faking images and now like, you know, try to do whatever. I don't know. Like, I feel like where they're going to leave it, they could have like left it with some more closure rather than being like the family got the grief closure. They moved on. And then, but the house is still there. Like, what about the, whoever moved into the house afterward? Did they see a ghost? Is there a reason for them to see a ghost? Like, I don't know if I may be overthinking it. It's a movie that I like. I can't say that I love. I can't say that I would recommend watching more than once. I don't think you need to see it more than once. I don't think there's anything there that you might miss or pick up on that would require a second viewing. If you enjoy it and you want to watch that kind of slow burn, by all means, like I think you could. Some people out there might. But I think from like, but let's, I don't want to, and I, I'm not trying to quell in the negative here, really. I, I want to focus on the positive. So, Joel Anderson put together this $1.7 million mockumentary, five weeks shooting it across Victoria, Australia. Uh, the acting was pretty good, albeit for, for general unknowns who went in there with no real script, but went in with an idea and had to basically convey emotion and had to try to figure out the way to perform these scenes to be compelling. The way it was edited was actually quite good. Uh, the use of, uh, uh, you know, of news media was really good when the, when the body went missing and everything else. I thought that was a good introduction as to do. You could kind of tell in a few areas, like I think there's one part in the movie where they have like a newscaster and you can totally tell that she's not a newscaster. But again, it is a 2008 low budget Australian supernatural thriller slash horror film. But people did like this movie. It did show up at South by Southwest. I believe it did pretty well. Uh, you know, people enjoyed it. Jordan Peele has said uh, that Lake Mungo is one of the movies that scared him the most, you know, so obviously people out there really, really, you know, people like Jordan Peele, who is a master of, of the horror thriller, whatever. He found himself enthralled by this. There's there, that kind of goes back to an old story involving paranormal activity where apparently Steven Spielberg had screened the movie. And when the movie was over, the doors were locked on his office and he didn't remember locking them. So he freaked out thinking that a ghost might've locked them. And it was that kind of unnerving take is what prompted him to help push the movie. So if you think about it, it's like the way that we respond psychologically to watching these things, given our surroundings can heavily influence how we view things. This movie was good, but I had interruptions, you know what I'm saying? And so it's, it, and it was a slow burn that was sometimes hard to get through because of the interruptions, because you just wanted it to keep going. You wanted it to get to that next thing to keep your interest. And I think it just, it maybe stumbled. I know it was trying to pad for time. When you go into a movie like this and you've only got, you know, we're talking 85, eight, less than 90 minutes, right? So maybe 85 minutes you've got to fill. That's the feature length number, right? You got to fill that time. So you've got to put the stuff in there that's going to keep it paced out well, but also get you to that point. My feature in search of, which I've, I'll mention multiple times at the show, that's only 72 minutes long, but I think it's briskly paced. I didn't want there to be fat. I wanted it to flow. And as a result of that, I should have probably added in maybe a couple more things that would have expanded it to at least 85 minutes, 
but I didn't. And I'm okay with the result of it, but still, I understand that, you know, you got to sometimes sacrifice story for pacing. If you're trying to pad it out for that amount, I guess, I don't know. I feel like if he would have tried to add a little bit more, maybe a little bit more of like the closure, a little bit more of maybe like the hunt for the neighbor or, or anything along those lines, you know, maybe like the Lake Mungo scene could have been expanded a little bit more trying to find it. They found it relatively quickly, but it is what it is. Um, you know, again, the movie is, the movie's fine. Yeah. I, I would say, give it a watch if you enjoy that sort of thing. Uh, and I, again, I'm recommending it cause I do think it's pretty decent on that front. You can find the movie right now on Tubi. It's also available on the Roku channel, Vudu free and freebie. You can rent it if you want on Amazon video, Google play movies, YouTube, Apple TV, Vudu, and the Microsoft store. It can also be purchased on Amazon. If you want to get the home video version of it. Physical media is always the way to go, so I'd kind of recommend it. There's a pretty cool, um, there's a pretty cool version of it on Amazon. Uh, that's uh, I don't know if it has any special features on it or whatnot, but it's definitely um, available. And you should always want to buy. You should always want to buy these to support filmmakers. And let's hope that Joel Anderson goes out there and makes another movie. You know, I think to me the biggest takeaway from this is this is a good first entry. And I'd love to see what this guy could come up with, with, with a bit of a, and I don't even want to say a higher budget technology now allows for a much more modest budget to be able to compel, uh, do a lot more stuff. I think the, the story was interesting. I think it had it gone into a darker element of why she killed herself because of what happened with the neighbor, maybe increased that like the neighbor had been a reason why she felt embarrassed. I mean, there's so many angles to take this that I think would have padded out that time uh, to hit that, that theatrical mark as well as giving us a story that not only has the grief of a family losing their daughter, but then why the daughter did what she did and her torment and, and you know, everything. I think you could have done more than on that front. But then again, that's just me. I am curious to know your guys' thoughts, your guys' opinions. Let me know. 400, or sorry, 323-400-4956 is our podcast line. Um, call in with your thoughts. I want to hear them. And uh, we'll talk to you guys soon. Have yourself a great day. Thank you again for watching. Be sure to like the video on YouTube. And uh, if you're subscribed on any of the podcast platforms, please, please let me know. Follow me on Twitter uh, at Podio Commentary or here on YouTube at 3 Buck Theater. Have a great week, everybody. I'll talk to you later. Peace out.